Welcome to the International Birch University podcast. The Department of Digital Communications and Public Relations is home to the IBU studio, podcast studio. I am Engin Obocic, your IBU host today. Former Federal Reserve Chairman Dr. Ben Bernanke was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics 2022. The Nobel Prize was conferred for research on banks and financial crises. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Malcolm Girod, a Harvard MBA graduate. Dr. Girod is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Economics and Social Sciences at International Birch University. In his prior career, Malcolm advised clients with over three billion dollars in assets. Welcome, Malcolm. Nice to see you, Andy. This is a very interesting topic, and I don't think many people know actually that Ben Bernanke was recently awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, please give us a background on Dr. Bernanke's research. Yeah, Ben Bernanke was the Federal Reserve Chairman during the financial crisis. So he was the main speaker and confidence giver to uh, Americans and the world with regards to how America and the Fed would navigate that banking crisis. Um, he was often on television. He was often giving speeches. And his background is uh, as an academic. I mean, he was a Harvard graduate. He lived in Winthrop House with Lloyd Blankfein as a roommate, who was a Goldman Sachs That's chairman. Yeah, these guys are all running in very small circles together, and he got his undergraduate there. He also went on to get his master's. He was a summa cum laude, you know, very smart student, uh, and went on to get his PhD at MIT. He had a very well-recognized committee there, and he's researched on the topic of long-term commitments, dynamic optimization, and the business cycle. So he was really uh, looking at past cycles and past uh, crises during his even early academic years. He went on to be a professor at Stanford for five or six years and then ten got tenure while he was teaching at Princeton. It's very interesting. Uh, you mentioned a business cycle. Would you please explain that to us, elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, the business cycle is a well-known economic uh, theory which uh, posits that businesses will have upswings uh, where they're gaining revenue and gaining momentum in their business. And, and, and if all businesses are together doing that in an economy, like in the country here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you would have kind of a positive up cycle in the, in, in the business economy. You'd have growth. The GDP or the gross domestic product would be increasing every year over year. But at some point that uh, peters out, that, that demand people lose confidence, interest rates go up, or something comes, some shock comes to, uh, to reduce uh, the business confidence and people stop buying as much and the growth slows down and you get a kind of a rollover in the growth rate and then you can even turn negative in growth in the GDP and then you kind of go down the other side of that slide of, of a graph of, a, of, of, a, of, the, of the revenues of the country and you get a recession. And that's the cycle, going up the slope growth and down to recession and then back up for growth. And hopefully all those ups and downs lead to a, a larger and larger economy over time. Um, but the question is, how big are those ups and how big are the downs? Because in the downs, you can have people's uh, businesses wiped away, asset loss, uh, bankruptcy, and all kinds of uh, disaster with uh, regular people, folks' businesses. And that kind of volatility doesn't allow for long-term investments, long-term thinking. So, in what way did Dr. Bernanke contribute to the business cycle shift or the dynamics of the business cycles? Yeah, in his thesis, he postulated something called the great moder moderation, and that was how governments could use policies to smooth out this cycle. They could use uh, Federal Reserve uh, monetary policy, either with increasing the money supply or uh, targeting a certain growth rate uh, and... Uh, checking on how people employ employment is going. And based on that, they can uh, either be active in the, in the open market uh, by increasing or decreasing the money supply, or they can change the interest rates higher if growth is out of control or lower if growth is, growth is slowing and they want to cushion that down, that uh, recessional, recessionary period. So this great moderation was sort of like, let's reduce the business cycle volatility and that could allow us to focus on other aspects of the economy instead of business cycle. So what is the role of banks in the economy and society? Right, so banks are going to be an intermediary 
uh, with the treasury of the country to lend out the savings, people's savings. So people save their money in banks. Banks uh, lend that money back out, and then they give a certain return to the savers. So they give like a, a time deposit we have here in Bosnia, the low, uh, some percentage for locking your money up for one year, you might get 2%. What, is that called fractional reserve banking? Or yeah, fractional reserve lending is a, lending. T- is a term that's used uh, to represent how much of the money that savers put in the bank is required by the law to ke- be kept in the bank. So uh, in America right now, it's 10%. Uh, in most countries, it, it's around this, that, amount, that amount. And that's because not everybody will come at the same time and take their money out of the bank. You know, most people are willing to uh, and have extra money and, sa- and save a lot of money. Uh, and, but they would like to get some return on that money. And banks would like to earn money. And so there's a spread there between what they lend the money out at and what they pay to the savers. And that's how the bank is making money. Um, and, but what's really going on there is you need a lot of moving pieces to protect that savings. You need Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, uh, standing behind that, which is a government insurance where all the banks pay some money into a fund and that can bail out anybody uh, whose bank doesn't uh, survive one of these recessions. You also have regulations that are monitoring the assets the bank holds. You have, uh, they're, they're doing things like verifying balances, looking at the loan to values. They're stress testing the banks. They also uh, observe who's on the board and the governance structures of the bank and, and put in different consumer protections around uh, uh, predatory uh, lending rates. Like you hear sometimes people take out credit at 25%. And there are some maximums in, in laws that uh, banks are not allowed to become predatory in their lending because it becomes unable for the consumer to pay back that percentage if it's too high. Mm-hmm. But one point about that. Yeah. I mean, in the whole world, this it, 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 we're talking mostly from a Western perspective right now, but in the rest of the world, there are different societal cultures and norms mm. that um, uh, dictate sometimes uh, no interest. For instance, we have here in our community uh, banks that don't charge interest, but they embed... Why is that? Well, due to cultural and, uh, and norms and, and social norms. So you can, you can have a more free uh, credit creation process, which might be in the West, but if you get more to the Middle East and even to the East, uh, there might be a culture of, of not taking loans, right? That might be against your belief to, to go into debt. And so how do you get business transacting uh, more you have to come up with uh, innovations, financial innovations, which what has happened in, in Islamic banking to allow for more credit creation. Um, the other thing is about uh, discharging bad loans or bankruptcy. How do you deal with uh, a business that takes a loan but can't pay it back? Uh, in America, it's after seven years. Uh, it goes off of your credit re- record if you uh, couldn't pay an unsecured loan. But in other uh, countries, your bank account is frozen and it's very hard to become unfrozen until you've repaid. And so these are also lubricants that allow for risk taking, for business creation and shutdown. And this is important uh, in our new society of, of entrepreneurship and innovation where you need uh, the ability to fail. You need, the, you need to be able to fail and then have that cleanup process of the failure be fairly uh, simple. And that's, that's one thing that I think uh, what East and West are learning from each other, um, but also we see that the, that the non-prudent lending practices and maybe uh, have, have uh, been a recent damage in the, I guess, the image of the Western banks. So I think, why has this happened? Because of globalization. Uh, we have the speed of business with communications and the internet. Um, You have currency exchange rates, you have all kinds of uh, debt issuance by governments, by corporations, and and not just New York and London matter anymore in terms of financial markets. We also have uh, other powerful uh, uh, markets in the world. You have the GCC, which is on a big rise with oil prices being so high. You have Asia with China's growth. So these new players in the market are influencing uh, what new uh, financial products come and also um, you know, how to catch up with innovative, innovative Western markets. Let me connect this to Ben Bernanke's yes. background. Uh, he spoke of failing banks. Uh, please expand on that. Uh, there was, uh, the failing banks played a decisive role in the 
1930s, the Great Depression. Uh, would you t- explain to us, you know, what role did the failing banks play, actually? Well, in general, um, I would say that two things. I mean, this uh, moderation uh, theory, you know, this great moderation theory that Bernanke came up with actually helps the West. The, why? Well, there's a temptation, a human temptation, uh, to speculate. Okay, there's land speculation, people buying land and thinking, okay, they're going to build a new freeway. So my land price will go up, I'll sell it to the, f- the people who want to develop on that new freeway. So in the human condition, there is a, a seeking of increasing wealth. And how do we do that? Well, we need money to start out with. In the West, it's easy to create credit. So um, you see Western uh, companies doing more innovative, more risk- risky uh, things they invest in high tech startups. They uh, take lots of uh, a risk, but with this great moderation, you also get longer time frames for the risk. That helps moderate that human instinct to take too much risk. When we get to the past, we learned from basically banks extending too much credit. That was the actual reason why you have uh, banks failing in general around the world. If you look at Greek banks in the Cypriot and Greek crisis the banks were loaning against real estate and again, and the real estate prices collapsed, and thus the bank loans uh, were insolvent because the asset that backed the loan was no longer worth the price of the loan. The asset fell below the amount of money that was lent. Mm-hmm. And so even if you put 20% down on your house, you actually, uh, if, the, if the land and the house goes down 20%, <laughs> you lose all the equity that you put in, and the bank is the one who loses. So when you have a, a mass uh, real estate uh, price correction, then you can have banks failing. Um, and that's also, that's what happened in the 20s in the Depression. You had people taking speculation, businesses uh, recovering after World War I, uh, asking for credit, getting, uh, getting credit from banks, uh, and then that being repeated over and over because of success. So that's the kind of success uh, fallacy, which is, if I was successful in the past, I'm going to be successful as a business person in the future. Well, not all the time. And then you you ex- get another credit extension from your bank because it's your next business idea, and this time you don't succeed. So if you have a lot of people doing that all at the same time, you get kind of uh, a big one of these big booms, and then you get a crash because of, yeah, uh, I would say bad lending practices mostly and overvalued uh, credit ratings we can talk about that in the more recent times so in light of what's going on in the world today our audience i know this for a fact would love to ask you under what conditions would bank fail today because uh, people tend to be scared Uh, there's a lot of inflation in the eu zone there's a lot of inflation around the world and people tend to be scared in such situations they look uh, to the past and they try to derive uh, certain, uh, draw certain conclusions from the past and, you know, superimpose those onto the present. So under what conditions would bank fail today? Uh, should we be scared? Yeah, we shouldn't be scared. And I'll give an example from the recent 2008 crisis. Basically, history uh, rhymes, but it doesn't repeat. So you get often um, the same underlying causes, which are speculation, uh margin loans, which means you're borrowing too much, and you also get a bad credit rating. So in 2008, what happened was uh, the banks borrowed money with government rating of AAA, but the underlying assets, the houses, were not AAA. The banks held those assets on their balance sheet, uh, and they started to deteriorate. So the housing prices started to turn negative, and they were actually holding an asset that was bought, but with the cus- with uh, savings, with savings in the customers, cus- from customers' accounts. So, in that case, though, what happened is uh, the system worked. The system, which is the Federal Reserve System, uh, backed up those uh, those banks by being the lender of last resort. So, what does this? What does the Federal Reserve do in the case of two thousand eight? They actually become the last buyer of all those bad loans. So they they actually print money. They buy all those bad loans, uh, they give the banks cash, and now the ca- the banks have the correct, uh, I would say, uh, 
ratio of cash to deposits, you know, that they're holding a better a ratio that was previously impaired by these bad assets they held. Now the Federal Reserve holds those assets, and now the Federal Reserve waits while those assets come to maturity. Uh, usually a housing loan is between 10 and 20 years, and so they will hold those, and they don't have to be in a business of making loans and making profit every year, and so they can just be this lender of last resort and hold those to maturity. The other thing that happens is they... Uh, they put some of these businesses into receivership. So when the situation is so extreme, they will use federal deposit insurance to pay out all the savings. They will use uh, re restructurings to uh, inject new equity, and the government becomes the actual owner of the bank uh, or the insurance company or the auto lender. And there are a few different examples in America where this happened. Uh, General Motors acceptance credit, the, the car loan financing arm of General Motors got bailed out and the government became the largest owner of the company. The same thing happened with AIG, the American uh, International uh, Insurance Group. It got bailed out. It was riding insurance on many of these bonds uh, due to profit motive. It was making profits riding these insurances and they didn't feel like any of these bonds would go bankrupt uh, because they had AAA ratings, but in the end they did and they were on the holding of uh, end or needed to pay out all those insurance and so when that occurred, uh, an $89 billion company became a $50 billion company, and the government got uh, close to half of the stock. So the government is the guarantor of the banking system. Exactly. And so in, in that sense, countries with looser regulations or less defined regulatory regimes will be at the mercy of uh, may, the customers in those countries would be at the mercy of of these type of banking crises. If we think of Ukraine, for instance, there's a war there now, but even in the recent past, many Ukrainian folks would not be uh, savers in their own banking system. Why? Because they had seen the government before not act in the similar way that the Federal Reserve Act to bail out banks when there was fraud or when there was asset impairment or savings was uh, lost. Well, it was invested improperly, and then the bank didn't have the cash that it promised the the savers to have. So it has to do with the regulatory um, framework that the banks are operating in. And that's why you see a lot of assets in the UK, a lot of assets in the United States, because those are proven uh, law abiding um, uh, countries and banking systems where banks have been sued and had to pay out to customers in these types of situations when there's been uh, crises. And so uh, you'll see that too in Asia. Singapore is a, is a major banking center for the similar reasons. They have strong laws to protect customers' deposits. And so when we're concerned, I guess, with uh, will a bank go bank fail or go under, we should look at the country's regulatory structure. We should look at the, the actions of the central bank in the past to bail out or not to bail out banks. And uh, that would lead us to be have more confidence to hold our savings in the banks in that country. So should we trust the banking system? Well, it's not that we're, we're trusting the bank system. We're trusting that uh, regulatory agency that over, oversees. So it has to do with the structure of the central bank often, has to do with the other depositors in the country, how long-term uh, people view the country's uh, prospects, the future prospects. You can check. Uh, the credit rating of the country, because most countries are issuing government debt and they are rated by uh, Standards and Poor's or Moody's in, in different categories of ratings. I think all those ratings have declined in the recent 20 years because of these different crises. But in general, you can still uh, say that even an Albanian debt uh, is, is a, a single A, I believe, in the market right now. And uh, that means they, that they will be having a lot a high percentage chance to pay back their bond. And because of that, they get a lower interest rate where you might find a, a smaller country, Sri, Sri Lanka, where there's lots of political instability. You might get a lot lower rating and thus a lot higher interest rate they need to pay uh, to to borrow money. So the interest rate is, is directly inversely related to the risk. If it's a higher interest rate that you're getting paid on any deposit at any bank or any uh, government, you should be concerned. Why? Because that means there's a higher risk they can't pay you back. And that's why the market has forced them to pay such a high interest rate on that uh, to borrow from you as the customer. So when you're a, a customer of a bank, 
uh, you're you're the you become the lender. You know, uh, there's an old saying. You know, when you lend a bank uh, fifty dollars or a hundred dollars, it's your problem. But if you lend the bank three million dollars, it's their problem uh, because you, you you might have an easier chance to recover the larger amount of money versus a smaller amount of money. So that's another tip I would say is to I would say check the deposit insurance rules at your in your country. Are they insured up to ten thousand? Are they insured up to a hundred thousand? In America, they recently changed from 100000 to 250000 mm-hmm. during oh, this great. crisis. That's, yeah. great. that's great. Well, given, given this background, yes. uh, what is the state of the EU, EU banking system today? Yeah, the EU banking system was affected by this 2008 crisis. And unfortunately, they didn't uh, do a, like a clean house at that time. Um, they're undercapitalized still. The governments did not step in uh, and make the banks... Um, take on new capital and so we have a lot of um uh but they did put more regulation so you kind of have uh, a low profit environment for the banks because there's so much regulation and so much uh restrictions uh and that doesn't allow them to grow or have any cushion in case there is a big crisis um that's different than the united states and 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 uh uk which restructured their banks and made them take in new capital and made them diversify the ownership towards more towards the government. Royal Bank of Scotland is one example that had to do that. So the European banks have lots of bad loans still left over from that crisis, actually. Um, yeah, so they are in a, 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 they also take on, on average, more leverage. So this is another thing that we're, we were talking about before was, why do banks fail? Because of leverage and because of bad loans. So we, we have some of these indications, and we've even seen recently, Italy has done some restructuring. The Montepaschi Bank got restructured recently. So there is some governments realizing that the banks are undercapitalized and that they need to take in more uh, public money to shore up their balance sheets. The positive side of the EU banking system is it is quite uh, well uh, invested in technology. So they, why is that important? Um, that allows them to assess risks better. That allows you as a customer to have access and kind of like uh, the ability to move money quickly. Um, so they have done a lot of in investment into uh, into these types of systems and um, technologies, and that uh, makes them, I guess, more compliant and more safe. Um, but I would say, you know, as a from a fundamental financial standpoint, there's still a little bit uh, needs to be done in terms of. Uh, uh, yeah, or being being more profitable and and get rid of some of their bad loans. So, how volatile is the EU banking system at the present stage, currently? Well, it's not very volatile because it doesn't take a lot of risks. Mm. Um, so it's safe. Essentially, on the other hand, well, that's a that's kind of a that it, that's kind of a um, it's kind of it looks safe, but it isn't. I would say <laughs> so. <All> I would right. <laughs> yeah because. Uh, it's actually more important that the bank generates profit. That's showing that you're a healthy bank. Healthy bank. Uh, if you're able to find new growth markets, new businesses that are growing, that you become the banker to, that gets you more profit, and that allows you to then have more safety for your customers. Because if you're profitable, you can be sued. <laughs> um, but if you're not profitable and you're and you're holding a lot of bad loans, you you may not take a lot of risk. So you could you could also become, you know, just. Uh, it could just become a situation where the risk is somehow hidden from the customer. All right. So how can Ben, the final words, how can Ben Bernanke's research help us with, with the current banking situation around the globe? Well, just that I think the main issue was that we got out of that financial crisis in 2008. Uh, it was a very serious situation where a lot of people were very concerned with the banking system in, in the United States, but also the rest of the world because some of that spread to the rest of the world. I guess the current developments are uh, monetar- modern monetary theory, uh, printing of money, uh, inflation, as you mentioned briefly. But I think understanding that uh, governments backstopping the banking system is a positive thing uh, and that that's what you should be looking for is strong regulatory frameworks and, and involved governments and in, very communicating, well-communicative uh, central bank heads. So if you don't know who your central bank head is and they're not in the public talking, that's what that's a bad sign. And if you do know the name of your central banker and they are around talking, 
that's a good sign because they're they're showing confidence in the in the market, and that's what I think uh, Bernanke gives us. He gives us a model of a good, of what a good what a good central banker looks like. Thank you, Malcolm. This has been very insightful. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, the Department of Digital Communications and Public Relations is the home to our IBU International Branch University podcast studio.